what a small r is. The output is a and little r, and I can tell you what they are. Namely, I write a as a power of four, so k is a non-negative integer, times a number which I call b, where four does not divide b. And then the algorithm pretends that b is square free, so the output that will be a, that is, well, exactly the formula of which I told you that everybody knows them. So, this is if b is one modulo four, and this is otherwise. And the little r, well, that is the absolute value of b if b is odd, and the absolute value of b over 2 if b is even. And that is exactly right if b happens to be square free. And if b is not square free, then the bad square divisors will be odd primes, and you can easily verify that it has the properties that I mention in the theorem. This can be generalized, and maybe I will have time for it, to polynomials replacing x squared minus a that satisfy a suitable condition. Okay, so let me then first continue dealing with some traditional wisdom here that you may be familiar with. And that refers again to the local case, the local case being the case that Q is a prime number. So let's start over here. So that is a proposition, and that is a criterion for P to divide this index. So for P's for which the P primary piece is really non-trivial. So I take K and R as before and P prime. Then the statement is that P divides the order of OK modulo R, so P is really a prime that requires work, that is clearly equivalent to this ring that I wish to determine being different from R. So my P primary piece of that finite abelian group is non-trivial, and that is also equivalent to the multiplier ring of a certain ideal to be bigger than R. So what do I mean by this? Well, the radical of the ideal generated by R that can be expressed in two ways. The definition is simply that it is the set of elements of R for which there exists a positive integer such that the power of that element, the nth power of that element, is lying in PR. And the second formula that you may know from commutative algebra is that it is the intersection of the prime ideals of R that contain little p. 
and those prime ideals are maximal and therefore it is not just the intersection but also the product of those ideals and that is why this is true. And I don't want to give the proof because it is exceedingly classical, many of you may know it already and it is also proved in the lecture notes. So that is how people often determine this piece if they know P, but then the question is what, how does one determine this radical? And this radical is, can be determined by one of two formulas and I will need them both, so I write them down both. This radical, if I take it modulo P, then it is the nil radical of the finite ring R modulo little p. And that nil radical can be computed as the kernel of a linear map. It is the set of y's in R mod pr with the property that if I apply a suitable power of the Frobenius to y, then it is zero. So here t is a non-negative integer for which p to the t is at least the degree of my number field. And you see, I could write down an n there, but nth powering is typically not a linear map. But p powering, and also if I do it t times, is a linear endomorphism of this vector space. You can just compute it on the basis elements, and you can determine the kernel by techniques from linear algebra, and there you will know what your radical of pr is. This is a formula that is valid for every prime number, but it has the drawback that if you try to apply it to numbers like Q that may not be prime or that are actually not prime, then well, Q's powering, if Q is not a prime number, has modulo Q really no good properties that you can count upon. So that makes this uh, formula pretty useless if you are not working with prime numbers. But then you can use the second formula, and the second formula that is the following. Uh, this radical of PR. If you take it modulo P, it is again some sort of trace radical, and that can be expressed by saying that if you look at the, uh, the elements of R that are also lying in P times this radical, this dual, this polar lattice, then you get exactly this trace radical, except that the trace radical need not be the nil radical, but that is the nil radical if there is no wildness, and I guarantee this by restricting this P to being greater than the degree. And that is a formula that you can easily evaluate in polynomial time, and that is also perfectly meaningful for numbers Q that are not necessarily prime, although nobody will say that in that case you do get a nil radical. In fact, you will not get a nil radical locally at the bad primes for which P square divides your Q. But at least you get something. So that is a proposition that I want to take for granted and that can be found everywhere in the classical literature and this classical literature maybe after three days also includes the lecture notes. Any questions about this? Okay. So, I now get to the point that 
I want to sketch, well, to actually describe this algorithm. And because of this condition on P, the small primes need separate treatment. So what I will first do is give you an algorithm in the special case that P is a prime number and we will need to use that algorithm only for small primes. But the algorithm as it stands is also valid for big primes. So that is the algorithm in the case if the Q, so if Q is a prime number which I call P. And you have to be aware of the fact that if Q is a prime number, then R will not be divisible by the square of any prime. So that means that for a prime number, we are really computing this ring. Locally, we can solve our problem. So how does that go? Well, let me get this algorithm. So we have input R and K and Q is P and we have to determine capital A. R will be one, so the, for the output I don't have to worry about R. I can also take it P, that makes no difference. But I have to start from a equal to R. And then what you do is that you compute the radical of PA. And you do that, well actually you can always do it with the first one and that is what we will need to do in our applications when P is small, but if P happens to be large you can also pick the second one. You compute this radical and you compute the multiplier ring of the radical which I call B if B is equal to A well, then we can apply the proposition and the proposition tells us that we are done. Then terminate with output A and with R equal to one. And if B is not A, well, this certainly contains A, so then it is bigger than A and the index will be some P power so B is really sitting b between A and the ring that I am computing, then replace A by B, so that is my new A, and you go back to this part of the algorithm and you continue. And that is a polynomial time algorithm that computes, so at the end, we do have, well, R equal one, of course, and A is really the P piece, so to speak, of the ring of integers. And it, yeah? Why don't you just compute the blower of the radical? Well, I think in this case they are actually the same. But I'm not certain. But you could do that. Well, let me not uh, 
take your time thinking about this. Thank you for your question and sorry for not being able to give a precise answer at this point. Okay, so that will be one of the ingredients of the main algorithm. And for the main algorithm, I will need some help, some auxiliary algorithm about finite abelian groups. So let me spend a little time talking about that problem. So if I take H to be a finite abelian group, then I can write it as a direct sum of cyclic groups of certain orders, di. So if this is a finite abelian group, and I write E for its exponent, the exponent of a finite abelian group is the least positive integer that annihilates the entire group, which is the LCM of these DI. Then it is clear that H is a module over the ring Z mod EZ. A module over Z mod EZ is nothing but a abelian group annihilated by E. And I will like this H to be projective, then H is a projective Z modulo EZ module. And well, depending on whether you know already what projective means or not, this is going to be a theorem or a definition. It is projective if and only if for all these di, di is what people used to call a unitary divisor of E, which means that it is co-prime to the complementary divisor. So if you know what projective is, then you can verify this. And if you cannot verify this, then you forget what projective means and you take this as a new definition. And it is clear that projectivity can easily be tested. And it's also easy to show that it is independent of the way of writing H as a sum of cyclic groups. And it is important to realize that this is automatic. Well, if E is a prime number, for example, then you have vector spaces, all modules over vectors of, over fields are projective. And, uh, and the same is true if E is not just prime, but, uh, but actually, well, no, not really prime, but only square free. If E is square free, then all divisors of E have this property. And when my numbers are square free, then this projectivity is automatic. But when there are these secret squares of primes hiding in my numbers, then in order to be able to prove anything, we really like to have projectivity. And that is realized by an algorithm. Here is a fact that there is a polynomial time algorithm, PTA, that on input this H computes an integer D and this integer D that is a divisor of E and it contains for our purposes the same information as E in the sense that it is divisible by the radical of E. So D and E have the same prime factors. And 
Additionally, if I restrict to the D torsion of H, so H square bracket D, that is the subgroup of H consisting of all elements annihilated by D, this HD will be projective over Z mod DZ. This is an algorithm that very easily can be obtained from what I talked about briefly on Monday, the co-prime base algorithm. And if you cannot figure it out for yourself, then I do believe that this is also sitting in the notes, in the last section of the notes, section seven. And that is something that I will use in the algorithm. Say, can you say that again? Specified in that way? Well, even if it isn't, you can always, with a deterministic polynomial time algorithm, compute di with this property. So in our case, it may not be given like this, so you do have to do some computation there. <coughs> okay, so let me then use all these ingredients for the algorithm that is uh, behind theorem eight. Okay. And it consists of two stages. In the first stage, we simply deal with the small primes. That is something that we did already that uses the algorithm on the rightmost blackboard. And in the second stage, we deal with the interesting piece, which is, so to speak, the product of all of the big primes, bigger than the degree that are still in my queue. So here's the algorithm for this theorem number eight. So we have input K and R and Q, and we need to compute a and R, and we first start from A equal R, and this little r, well, it is essentially Q, but let's right away remove some completely irrelevant prime divisors from Q that will never play a role by replacing R with the GCD of Q and the discriminant. And then what you do, that is stage one, for all primes, and these are only the small primes, P at most the degree, and only the primes that we care about, so those are the primes dividing R, and we do that starting from P is two, three, etc. in succession, we apply 